So it is really, truly my honor to bring Steve to talk to you about what actually had been done uh, on this field discussing the global contribution of pancreatic cancer. And he's providing the national leadership in this area. Steve? So uh, thanks, thanks, Bill and Aggie. Um, I think I was in that first meeting that you described, Aggie, that Bill was there, Howard was there, Joe was there, um, where you st first started to conceptualize what the foundation could be. And uh, it's been a long ways, and congratulations. It's amazing. Um, so what um, Aggie and Bill wanted me to uh, talk about is um, actually, um, I would say, one of the um, uh, great outcomes of the work that started here. Um, so it's been a long struggle. I think when we first started, um, it was hard to get funding for research in pancreatic cancer. It was almost felt that it was hopeless uh, by the scientists, and that was really sad. Um, there's been a recognition that, um, that that's not, not accepted anymore. And uh, that's happened, I guess, over the past several years. We had several seminars, uh, meetings at NIH, and these were all driven by foundations like Aggies to make the government do something about it. And as Bill said, we're, we're in, a, in a global uh, collaborative research stage now. And what I was going to describe is one of the key drivers of that. So what happened um, is that NIH, I think, started the governmental approach or the country approaches um, from a lot of lobbying by Aggie's group um, and other associated groups to Congress and then the president to sign a bill that I'll, I'll actually show you the abstract of the bill. It was called the Recalcitrant Act, Cancer Act, and that was done in 2013. And there's been, and that, that Cancer Act has driven a lot of programs. And what I'm gonna do today is describe a key program that, that I'm involved in leading, and some of us here are involved in, Margaret Tim Farrell right there, uh, is a friendly face who's always with us when we meet in Bethesda. And it's a program that's designed to do way more than we ever thought we could do. And that is to find the cancer very early so that the therapies that we do have, like surgery and even new th therapies that are less to toxic and less, have less adverse effects can have an effect. So we're all into early diagnosis and early therapy. I will tell you also that um, um, I get in late last night uh, from NI a trip to NIH um, where the group that works with early therapy and prevention was meeting and where I presented the work of our consortium that I'll describe to you um, in that um, um, the, the new, new vision for all of uh, cancer work in the United States through the National Cancer Institute is prevention. Dr. Ned Sharpless, who is the new uh, director of NCI, uh, talked to us about his key, key programs that he wants to put in place. And it's largely around prevention, early detection, and new therapies to deal with the disease when it's in its very early stages. And so what I'm going to describe to you is right within that vision. Um, and uh, I'll tell you how we're trying to do it. So, so first of all, um, the, the, the group I'm going to talk to you about, which is kind of a center part of a, of a national strategy to improve the early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, and then start intervention therapies, um, uh, including prevention, is called the Consortium for the Study of Chronic Pancreatitis, Diabetes, and Pancreatic Cancer. Um, we call it C CPDPC. It's a palindrome. Um, Another unique thing about this is that, um, as I'll describe to you, pancreatic disease um, and pancreatic cancer have a lot of interplays, and I'll try to describe those to you. And it's complicated, and that's partly, I think, why people were scared to address it. And so this includes diseases that are, that are obviously pancreatic cancer, but diseases that are associated with pancreatic cancer and can exist at the same time as the pancreatic cancer, and those are chronic pancreatitis and diabetes. And I'll mention this a couple times, but diabetes, um, ha, uh, gives um, um, a proportional risk of pancreatic cancer of about 50%. That's unique for pancreatic cancer. Other cancers, uh, which, which we're, we're actually finding and, and publishing now, like colon cancer, breast cancer, don't have that association. So pancreatic cancer is very unique. And so understanding how diabetes and pancreatic cancer, and even inflammatory diseases like chronic pancreatitis interact, are of critical importance to understand what to do. 
So th this, this consortium is headed by Chris Forsmark, who is at the University of Florida, uh, myself, uh, uh, Jose Serrano, who is the leader at NIDDK, Joanne Renato, who's the leader of the program at NCI, and then we have a coordinating center uh, that makes all the data we get from patients and try to understand it. Um, it's at MD Anderson in, in, in Houston, and it's headed by uh, Zitting Fang. So that's the leadership. And I'm starting with a, a, a Malawi uh, proverb that I think represents how we work, and that is one finger cannot lift a pebble. You'll see uh, as I go along, this involves uh, hundreds of people. Uh, I can't tell you the exact number because it just keeps spreading and the networks are larger than I think any of us know. Um, this is the case for early prevention or for prevention and early diagnosis and treatment strategies. And you all know this all so well. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the disease is worldwide. It's not, it's not in the United States alone. And um, the other thing that Bill mentioned is this program is collaborating with other uh, international programs. At, at our meeting just, just now um, that I'm returning from, we have collaborations we're developing with Japan, and also we have ongoing collaborations we've developed in the UK at both uh, Liverpool and in, in London with key investigators uh, who work on early diagnosis methods for pancreatic cancer. So we're, we're, we started local, uh, actually, in rooms like this, and uh, we're moving international. And uh, the reason it's, it's, it has to be that way is in order to identify uh, early signs of pancreatic cancer, uh, it takes evaluating markers and behaviors of disease in, in a lots of people because it's a relatively rare cancer. And so it, the programs we, we involve patients in um, uh, are as large as 10,000 to 30,000 patients. So they're not small. And so that why, that's why it takes a lot of uh, investigators, people, to put these programs together, and al also why um, uh, it has to be international. So um, as I alluded to before, this started with a lot of effort with, from uh, nonprofit groups like Aggies. And as I indicated, you'll see on my slides, at the top, it's, it's supported by two um, uh, cancer institutes, or two institutes at NIH, the National Institutes of Diabetes and Digestive Disease and Kidney Disease, and the National Cancer Institute. And the actual government involvement started with the Recalcitrant Act Cancer Act, which again was pushed forward by nonprofits like PANCAM, PANCAM and uh, Aggie Hirschberg Foundation, and the National uh, Pancreas Foundation. And this is just an abstract of the of the um, Recalcitrant Calcitrant Cancer Act, and it, um, it was signed into law in 2013 by former President Obama. Um, and what um, this act required Congress to do is to establish a scientific framework for pancreatic cancer and other deadly cancers. So pancreatic cancer was the, the key one, but other deadly cancers like ovarian cancers are included. And these are ones where the, where the survival rates were, were low. And what it, what it forced the uh, National Cancer Institute and its associate institutes to do is to evaluate their programs and to take advantage of whatever they had that was valuable, but come up with new programs, such as the one that I'll describe, to make a difference. And that was, that was the case. I think everybody realized that uh, we did have to understand the, uh, the patient population that's at risk for pancreatic cancer and how we can put in uh, steps and interventions that could prevent the progression to pancreatic cancer. So that's, that's what this act did. It forced NCI to think about things a little bit differently. Um, so our consortium, it was uh, established in, uh, this is, I'll go into the details of our consortium and then come back out of it. So our, our consortium was established in September 25th, 2015. So it's just a little over two years old. And again, we call it Consortium to Study Chronic Pancreatitis, Diabetes, and Pancreatic Cancer. And you'll see our mission we were given to by the government uh, was kind of general. Uh, um, and then I'll show you how we turned that into specifics. It says the National Institutes of Health will support research into complex pancreatic diseases through the National Institutes of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases, and the National Cancer Institute. So then what do we do? So, so what happened is that we got um, 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 several centers in the United States established through, um, through what's called an RFA procedure. Those centers 
uh, groups applied throughout the United States, and there was a competition, and 10 centers were successful, and then they put, put us in a room, and they said, figure this out, and I'll show you what we figured out from that. But I wanted to first show you why, why, why we wanted to, to look at pancreatic disease in its, I would say, its whole, in its complexity, because it is complex. And so this slide I used to describe the complexity of the disease, and um, in the middle, I have a, um, a series that uh, describes the different kinds of pancreatic disease. So I have acute pancreatitis, recurrent acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, then I have diabetes and pancreatic uh, cancer or pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So it's been known from ep epidemiologic studies that a, that a group of patients that go on to, um, to develop pancreatic cancer have this kind of sequence. And so, for example, if you get to the stage, if, if one gets to the stage of chronic pancreatitis, the risk of developing pancreatic cancer actually extreme, ex increases extremely high. It's about 15 to 20 times the, the average population. Some of those patients, because the, the, the cells that make um, insulin, they're uh, called the beta cells or the islets of Langerhans, sit right in the pancreas which is the part that gets uh, pancreatitis, those cells that make insulin get affected. And so the patients with chronic pancreatitis go on to get frequently, excuse me, diabetes. We call it type 3C diabetes. It's not like type 1 or type 2. It's called type 3C. And what we, what we mean by that, at least right now by definition, is it's diabetes secondary to inflammatory disease of the pancreas or cancer of the pancreas. And so if, if, a, if a patient has diabetes in the context of chronic pancreatitis, the risk goes up 30 times. So it's one of the highest risk factors we have for uh, pancreatic cancer and is a, a population to study. Although it doesn't represent all the patients with pancreatic cancer, it, it represents a population that we could look at the sequence and find predictors that go through these different steps. And those are, we often call them biomarkers or, or lab tests that can be predictors of the progression. And those predictors that we discover can help us discover or find patient, uh, um, um, values in patients who, who don't have this sequence. So that's the idea. It gets a little more complicated because um, where I have the arrow going from diabetes to pan pancreatic adenocarcinoma, it actually goes the other way too. Pancreatic cancer can present frequently with diabetes. And that actually is an observation that, that we've known for a long time, but it was developed the best by the group at Mayo Clinic, uh, headed by uh, Suresh Chari, who's very much part of our group, where they identified in Olmsted County that those patients who develop diabetes after age 50 have about a 2% uh, chance of going on to get a getting pancreatic cancer. So 2% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're thinking about it, a, a relatively rare disease, that is a lot. And it actually happens to be one of our best biomarkers. So we're starting to develop types of patients who have this so-called diabetes. Uh, we say after age 50, we call it new onset diabetes after age 50 or late onset diabetes. We have a r relatively rich population of patients that go on to cancer there, as well as those with chronic pancreatitis. So you start to see the, the connectors. We have, we have risk uh, patients who are at risk that we can start to look at very early on before they develop pancreatic cancer, and we follow them through, through their lives and try to see what predictors come up that we weren't looking at before that can help us. And those can include changes in weight, uh, they can include changes in appetite, but more importantly, we're looking at molecular things that we can find in their blood or urine that can, that can be tests that we can ultimately develop so that we can help predict even better. Now in the outside circles, I have risk factors for pa these pancreatic diseases in general. Uh, these risk factors like uh, digestive enzyme mutations, that's called hereditary pancreatitis. It's relatively even more rare, uh, but there are a group of patients um, that uh, have a, a in a mutation in one of the digestive enzymes that the pancreas makes to digest our food. And those mutations lead to this uh, re recurrent chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and pancreatic cancer, cancer. Some of them, one's called hereditary pancreatitis, has a lifetime risk of 50% to develop pancreatic cancer. So we actually have in our na uh, national, international network, we have pediatric cases that we recruit because we need to see their lifetime progress. So um, um, in those patients, um, the, the type of genetic defect, 
uh, and early markers of disease are extremely important to us because they're going to help us understand what's happening as adults as well. Uh, and then I indicated diabetes before, and diabetes is a large proportional risk factor for, uh, uh, for pancreatic cancer, both before and then, as I said, sometimes as a hallmark of pancreatic cancer. And alcohol and smoking, smoking more than, than alcohol, uh, smoking being a, a, a well-identified risk factor for pancreatic cancer. So I'm going to show you now a little bit about the operations of how we work. So these are the names of the centers in the United States. Um, and um, you can see they're spread through the United States, and I'll, I have a, a map that comes next that, that, that helps you see uh, more visually where they, where they are. Um, the, I'll give you a, an example that it's a little more complicated than just a one site. So here it says Cedar sinai L.A., uh, Pandal Gudarzi. Um, uh, Dr. Guzar Gudarzi is an expert um, diabetic uh, uh, practitioner and scientist here in Los Angeles. And so you can see that we make a good team because he's the diabetes side, I'm the other part of the pancreas side, and so the projects go across both, so it's very collaborative. But it's even more collaborative than that. This center involves um, most of the academic centers in Los Angeles. So we're, we're like a hub of a, a network in Los Angeles. So we involve um, the county hospitals like Harvard General, uh, USC, uh, UCLA, the VA, and, and actually importantly, Kaiser. Kaiser uh, happens to be extremely important in our whole network because what Kaiser has is uh, hopefully other healthcare organizations, including the University of California, are building these, but Kaiser has had a long uh, standing um, electronic medical record that has good detail where we can actually look at somebody and try to understand what the risk factors were, what happened to them many years before by doing epidemiologic studies in electronic medical record records. And so part of our consortium actually works a lot with computer scientists that work on electronic medical records so we can actually better see what the natural history of development of the disease is. And so uh, the Kaiser in Los Angeles, um, uh, and that group headed by Dr. Beecham Wu here, um, is, is very critical to our, to our mission. Also, the Northern California Kaiser is involved as well. So here, here we are on a map, uh, and you can see in California, there are three centers, uh, the one I just described, uh, Stanford, and Kaiser Northern California. So Kaiser Southern California is part of our group and, and, and that, that we, that's titled CEDARS. And um, the uh, Northern California group, um, um, uh, Kaiser, is associated with UCSF. And, and Margaret Tempero is the, uh, uh, the co-leader there. Um, but you also see that we're um, spread throughout the United States. Mayo Clinic, where Suresh Chari is, uh, I indicated, had really worked up the relationship and his group with Gloria Peterson worked up the relationship between diabetes and pancreatic cancer. Um, University of Pittsburgh was important because they developed our understanding of mutations. Uh, David Whitcomb is there, and he and his group have developed our understanding of relationships be between mutations in the pancreas and development of cancer. Um, and I'll also point out um, uh, University of Texas MD Anderson, where our coordinator center is. So these, these studies. Uh, create lots and lots of data points for each patient. They're all entered electronically, and even when we have samples and put them in the freezer, they have tags, RFID tags, that we need to have found whenever we need them. So it's a large project, and there's a, there's a great a coordinating center at, at uh, MD Anderson, headed by uh, Zitting Fang, who actually is one of the United States experts on this kind of thing. And so they keep us straight. They, they, they watch each patient coming in and make sure that everything is done appropriately. So um, how did we do this? So as I told you earlier, um, um, this started in September of 2015, but it started um, uh, after a competition, and these, these sites were selected to be uh, in the consortium. And then, we, then, then, um, then they basically said, look, our whole goal is to be preventive and to make early diagnosis and then use those patients with early diagnosis to think about new therapies. I mean, one of the driving forces that we all had that we knew about is that the earlier we make the diagnosis and institute the surgical therapy, uh, the, the, the greater the outcome or the better the outcome would be. So one clear thing is if we make an early diagnosis uh, earlier than we're doing now, then we would be able to intervene with surgical therapy and that should 
lead to better outcomes. And so that was a driving force in, in our minds. But we knew that those cancers at that early stage would also be amenable to new therapies, new therapies that would be less toxic. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So, so it might change our whole thinking about therapeutics in this disease. And as you know, the therapies right now are relatively toxic when they're used uh, in, in more advanced disease. So we divided ourselves into um, working groups. So it's just a lot of alphabet soup almost. And so whenever you put working groups together, they try to give themselves a name that they can repeat without the whole name. And so they, they make up uh, you know, uh, titles like this one called Inspire. So I'll try to tell you a little bit about what they are here, and then I'll tell you what, a little about what they do. So I indicated earlier we have um, a pediatric group. Uh, it's called um, um, Acute Recurrent Pancreatitis. That's ARP, Chronic Pancreatitis. Pediatric INSPIRE. So what does INSPIRE stand for? International Study Group of Pediatric um, Patients in Search for a Cure. And it's headed by uh, Aliyah Uch and Mark Lowe. Um, Aliyah is at University of Iowa, and Mark is at um, uh, Washington University in, in St. Louis. They have, um, they're more networked than any of the other centers. They have 24 centers internationally. Um, and they recruit kids, uh, young adults uh, under age 18 who have recurrent pancreatitis. As I indicated earlier, they have a lifetime risk of cancer that's quite high. So they're recruited into this this cohort. And what are we looking for there? So we're looking for there. We're looking there for the kinds of mutations they have, that that are ones that um, lead to. Uh, pancreatic cancer. So as I indicated, some of the mutations we know already have about a 50% uh, chance of getting uh, the, the patient getting cancer in, in their lifetime. And so, um, so it's, a, it's a, a group that first we need to help a lot, but secondly is that we could actually find out which one of those mutations are the most damaging and the most likely to lead to cancer that, that we need to understand and deal with earlier um, and, and develop interventions. So, so it's a important, very important group of ours. So the next one is called uh, uh, Adult Proceed, and it's acute, recurrent, uh, and chronic pancreatitis for adults, and it's headed by um, um, Diraj Yadav, who's at Pittsburgh, and Darwin Conwell from Ohio State, and they have a trial, a, a, a cohort trial, called Prospective Evaluation of Chronic Pancreatitis for Epidemiologic and Translational Studies. So they, like the pediatric group, are, are putting uh, patients, enrolling them in a cohort where they're collecting blood samples and lots of historical information, and then monitoring them. And we actually say we're gonna monitor them from 20 years or more. So will the federal government keep giving us that money for 20 years? Actually, I think they have to. Uh, the, it, the way it is now, I mean, we're so embedded now in the thinking of NCI that I don't think they can back out uh, because it would be, um, I, I think, um, and more than embarrassing, it would be uh, a threat to the health of the country. So that's what I'll tell them. Okay. So, so the next uh, one is uh, something I referred to before. It's a cohort uh, called Early Detection of Pancreatic Cancer, or NOD. New Onset Diabetes After Age 50, and it's headed by Dr. Uh, Anurban Maitra, who's at MD Anderson, and uh, Suresh Chari, who's at um, Mayo Clinic. And, and there we're re enrolling 10,000 patients in the United States um, and who have diabetes that develops is first noticed after age 50, and then we monitor them for three years. But again, getting historical information, blood samples, urine samples, et cetera, to see if we can find the earliest marker of, of pancreatic cancer. And again, about 2% of those patients go on to get cancer, so we have to have a large number to really find those patients who, who go on to develop pancreatic cancer. Um, we are now in collaboration in this one with uh, Japan, as I said, and uh, also a couple groups in the UK. And so the, probably the total number will go up to about 20,000. And then finally, we have a group called Type 3C Diabetes, and it's headed by Mark Godarzi, who's here in Los Angeles, and Aida Haptezion, who's at Stanford. And so in these patients, uh, we have a study called DETECT, and we're evaluating how, uh, how they their diabetes works, basically. And so uh, these patients are giving a, a, given a meal, and then we follow all the different hormones 
involved in regulating uh, metabolism, all the way from the gut hormones that promote insulin secretion to insulin secretion, then how insulin works, with the idea that we could find out in pancreatic cancer or those who are susceptible to pancreatic cancer if there is a different kind of diabetes that we can actually measure. We have a blood test that we can measure. Then those patients who develop diabetes, we can have a second blood test to say if there are risks for, for cancer. And that's the general idea about that one. Uh, and that one actually is being headed out of Cedar sinai with Mark. He, he's in charge of that project. Um, I, would, I, I was just going to feature um, a, a, a two of them, but I'll be a little bit brief on this. Um, but just to give you an idea of how it operates just to another level. So this was the one that I talked about that's headed by uh, Suresh Chari and Anurban Maitra. And the, the primary hypothesis is that um, and objectives are that if we have an assembly of, of cohorts of subjects over age 50 who have new onset diabetes, they would allow us to be able to estimate the probability of pancreatic ductal adenosine carcinoma or pancreatic cancer in that cohort through passive surveillance. Passive surveillance just means that we do uh, nothing more than we meet with them every six months, uh, get uh, history about what's going on with them uh, from a medical point of view, understand any medicine changes, but then also we draw blood and get urine and, and uh, other bio samples that, so we can find markers that could be predictive of going on to, to cancer in that small number that will. Um, and then um, the other thing about that is in, in the process of that we establish biobanks of clinically annotated biospecimens that can be used as a reference set for anybody in the world who has a new idea about a marker, early marker of cancer, comes to us and says, I have this test that could be used on your samples, and then I can help develop that test you absolutely need. So we're advertising throughout the world, anybody who has a marker that they think could work in this population to identify those patients who are gonna go on to cancer, we have the samples for them. This is often exactly how cohort studies are done. Uh, we have to have the population at risk, and then we have to find tools that we can apply to that population at risk to ferret out those who might have the greater risk of cancer versus less. And then, as you can see, the last one is kind of repeating a lot of things that I've said, but to facilitate emerging tests and their development. The other one I'll just point out very briefly um, is the one that was the last on the list, and it's called DETECT. And you can see the words that, it, it, that DETECT stands for. And the hypothesis there is that a blunted pancreatic polypeptide, PP. So what's pancreatic polypeptide? It's, a, it's another hormone in our GI tract, and it's in the islets of Langerhans sitting in cells right next to the insulin cells that also is important for regulating um, uh, metabolism. Um, the pancreatic polypeptide um, story um, was, um, um, comes up from a couple investigators, Suresh Chari uh, in Mayo Clinic, also Dana Anderson, who's one of our program officers in, at NIH, where they found that patients who had diabetes secondary to uh, pancreatic disease like pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer don't have a rise in some of the, these hormones during a meal. So when you eat, a lot of things are happening with these hormones. Uh, insulin obviously increases, but also this pancreatic polypeptide increases. Well, they found in patients with pancreatic disease that it does not rise. So another idea about a test is that if you uh, have diabetes in a later age, after age 50, and we don't know exactly why you got diabetes, um, you might be somebody who we could identify has pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer by giving you a test and see if the pancreatic polypeptide levels change when, when you eat a meal. So that, that's actually just starting uh, next week. Some of these uh, cohorts have already started. The, the first couple that I've described have started. This one's starting a little bit late. Um, um, uh, but we're moving along. The, um, so, so another, what, what makes these uh, programs rich and complex is they have these cohorts of patients we follow to find markers as, as the patients get older. But then there's a, what, what happens is you, then you start to look at the field and you say, oh my gosh, you know, we don't know this, we don't know that. There's a whole bunch of things that we figure out that, that we don't know. And so, so that creates other studies. So we now have about 30 attached studies. Um, and we try to vet those the best we can and provide resources to them to come 
to some kind of outcome that's beneficial for the, for the patients uh, and um, to understand those who are at risk for cancer and how we could attenuate those risks. So we have about 30, and, and, and I just put them in types just so you're aware of the kind of types of things that we do. So the first one, first one on this list are epidemiologic studies using large electronic medical record data sets and established cohorts. So, so I indicated further that we really like to work with Kaiser because they, we have well annotated um, uh, data sets and we can actually study disease in, in electronic records. Uh, and so that's a big effort, both uh, Kaiser's in Northern and Southern California. But there are also established cohorts that have been developed by NCI over the years to evaluate, evaluate cancer risks and heart disease risks, et cetera. But some of those patients develop pancreatic cancer. So we can use the information that those cohorts have uh, to help make, uh, be get more information that can help us meet our mission. So for example, there's a large cohort that's been going on since 1995 at USC. It's called a multi-ethnic cohort. Uh, that's because it's a cohort that was developed between California and Hawaii to collect patients and follow their nutritional patterns, lifestyle patterns, over several years. Now it's 2017 or 18, so it's been over many years. And, um, and they collect a lot of information, and they also uh, have diseases that these patients develop, from heart disease to different cancers, et cetera. And so we're able to to actually look at the patients that develop pancreatic cancer in those groups, in, in that kind of cohort, and then try to see what was happening to those patients beforehand. So we look at whether they drink coffee, you know, how much vitamin D they have in their diet, whether what the saturated, unsaturated fat is in their diet, um, whether they drink, smoke, et cetera. So we have that data, when we, and we use that data to get more information about the risks and how we can use those risks to develop, ultimately, with all the things I'm talking about, a risk model. Like, like you go to your cardiologist, or I go to my cardiologist, and he tells me what my risks are and how much statin I have to take or whatever. Well, ultimately, we should be able to have risk models for different cancers, and we should be able to identify and talk to patients who have uh, higher risk and, and, and have a, a risk, uh, what do you call it, strategy to attenuate the risk. So that's the idea, putting these things together into a risk model. And we have somebody in our group uh, that we that's the head of our risk model development. Her name is Christy Gian, who's here. She's an epidemiologist here in, uh, in Los Angeles. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking to myself, well, I could go on and on here, but we, we have several kinds of studies we do that are unique uh, to figure out the best way we can to, to monitor patients before they get a disease to figure out what we could do to change those factors so they don't get the disease. That's the general idea here. The last bullet I'm gonna go into a little bit more. We actually have started intervention trials. Those who are at risk, can we attenuate risk? And, and I'm gonna just show you that for a minute and that, that will be, um, uh, uh, that will be all I'll go over and then you guys can ask me a lot of questions. Um, so as one of the um, projects came out of a small discussion of a few, us, few of us and so, so, so I as a pancreatic expert was asked by one of my epidemiology experts in the group who has contact with the so-called preventive program at NCI, and he said, Steve, how can we prevent pancreatic cancer? I know you guys are working on you know, doing things after it develops, but what can we do to prevent it? And I actually, this was like three years ago, and I said, I don't know, Mark, I don't know the answer to that right now. So I thought about it and thought about it, and I, I went back, and I said, you know what, I think I have an idea how we could do this. And so, um, we had been working with uh, Kaiser in Southern California, uh, down, down su uh, on Sunset, um, uh, with, with um, a collaborator, his name is Beecham Wu. He's the second to last person in the list. And Beecham had used the electronic database, he does use it for a lot of things, but, he, but what one thing he found is those patients who were taking statins, mostly simvastatin because Kaiser um, chooses that as their major statin, um, had a markedly decreased risk of developing pancreatic uh, pancreatitis. And I'll tell you about pancreatic cancer in a moment, moment. but they had a markedly decreased risk of developing uh, pancreatitis. It was a 60% reduction. And he didn't find any other variables in that group that it could account for that reduction. So he had been telling me about this and published it. And so um, I took that back to Mark Goodman, who's the person who was asking me these questions. He's first in line there, and I said, Mark, 
what do you think about preventing the sequence of, of, of pancreatic diseases that leads to pancreatic cancer? And so we talked to the folks at NIH and they said, wow, that would be great. We have nothing in prevention of pancreatic cancer, so let's do it. So we develop a protocol, it go through, went through the usual study sections, et cetera, that, they, that we have to go through when we submit projects to NIH, and it was approved. And, and, and it was approved mainly for the concepts I've been telling you about, and also we don't have anything in prevention at that stage. Uh, again, it's a smaller group, but we have to start somewhere, so that's where we started. And so, um, um, we, we, this is the, uh, the, the objective of our study. It's called statin therapy to reduce the risk of recurrent pancreatitis, to stop that sequence from going forward. And so our, our goal is to uh, evaluate the effect of simvastatin intervention versus placebo, so it's a blinded control trial, on the change in secretin-stimulated pancreatic bicarbonate secretion. So you're going to ask me what that is, and I'll tell you in a minute. And pancreatic fluid at six months post-treatment in patients hospitalized for acute or chronic pancreatitis with a prior history of, of one other episode of pancreatitis. So they have, it, they have recurrent episodes is the basic idea. So what's peak bicarbonate secretion? So we said, well, we're just going to count up the number of times the patient has to go to the hospital for pancreatitis. They said, no, you have to make it much harder. We have to figure out all those things we can figure out in these patients to help us now understand better the mechanisms of why patients go on. And so Secret and stimulated bicarbonate secretion is actually something Bill did uh, how many years ago? 40 years ago, something like that. Yeah, 40. Yeah, I read some of his papers, some back 50 years, just so we know. <laughs> so so, so uh, secretin is a hormone that comes from our intestine that actually stimulates the, the pancreas. It stimulates both the endocrine, the insulin part, and the exocrine part. Uh, but secretin stimulates secretion of bicarbonate from the pancreas, and the bicarbonate's important because it neutralizes the acid coming from the stomach and makes the environment for digestion with the digestive enzymes neutral and not acidic so that they work really well. And so it's kind of a standard test for pancreatic function. So our hypothesis would be that with pancreatitis, the function goes down, and those people who aren't going to have any recurrences or further damage, it's going to go back towards normal, and statins would do that. And those who aren't taking statins, it wouldn't come back to normal, so it'd stay decreased. That was the simple idea, and we're in the in the um, uh, program right now, and we have uh, Kaiser, um, Cedars, and now we're incorporating uh, Stanford and uh, Pittsburgh in our in our um, trial, and it's a pilot trial. It's hard to recruit patients, actually, uh, because there are not many that meet all, all of our criteria. So, but anyway, we're measuring everything we could think of, and so when. Uh, so the primary objective was to measure the secretin stimulated by carbon excretion, but this says we're, we're, we're collecting and measuring everything we could think of that we think could be related to those patients who are more risk for cancer versus those who aren't in this group. So there's just a list of those. Um, so this is my final slide, and um, it, it's to point out what our, I gave you a lot of things that we do, but to point out that we have a really an overriding goal that we think should, should be able to change people's lives in the field. And that is um, to identify um, those who are at risk early and that we intercept. We don't wait till the disease develops. We intercept at a very early stage in the disease to prevent pancreatic cancer. And as you can see, we're also trying to prevent those other diseases that, that create the risk for pancreatic cancer. So, because we think they're so connected, we don't think we could step out of one of them and have a full effect. One of the things that I, I put a couple things down here that we're working really hard on, and one thing that I came to realize is that our imaging isn't as good as it should be. Uh, so, for example, we have, and, and Suresh Chari, Chari talks about this a lot, we have patients um, who have been described who, who have had a CT or an MR for symptoms, but that there's no diagnosis made by the CT or MR, and then sometime later the symptoms increase, and they go to another doctor, another hospital, something like that. It may not be too unfamiliar story here, and they get a CT or MR and a cancer is found. That's, that's really a travesty. So we, we know that there can be operator error, the radiologist maybe, but errors may not be the right word. There might be uh, insensitivity in the measurement by that operator, or the machines aren't good enough. And so we, we, are, we have a, a group 
uh, working on improving the performance of the machines and with using things like artificial intelligence, try to help the machines help the human being who's reading those so that we can find the cancers earlier and earlier. So, so if you, so for example, MRs are lots of data points and they're, they're represented in a picture that the radiologist looks at. However, there are things probably in that data set that, that are not visible. And so what the, what the um, acquisition methods we're developing do is take those signals and re-represent them in ways that can be visible to somebody who's operating and also have cues to, in, a, in a, like an artificial intelligence way, cues to help the operator better recognize those uh, abnormalities. So I'm going to leave it at that, and um, I'm open for questions. Where, where were we 20 years ago compared to this project? Yeah, well, uh, we were in different worlds. Um, let me compare myself to Margaret, okay? If that's, I don't want to put you on the spot, but so Margaret was thinking about the best chemotherapy combination that she could uh, come up with uh, and different strategies to do that. I was thinking about cell signals inside of a cancer cell to figure out you know, what goes awry. I wasn't thinking with her, you know? I wasn't thinking, oh, could we team up together? What, what we're doing is, for me, miraculous, um, because we don't usually talk that way. We don't usually interact that way. So, so um, I think it's been a transformation in science. Um, that is not happening enough, and I, I'm starting to, re I, I had to get gray hair, I guess, to, for this to happen. I don't know what it is, but, but I think we're realizing more and more and more that we can't do things as individuals. We need multidisciplinary approaches. We need the mathematicians, the bioengineers to work on c imaging machines. We need the chemists. We need the doctors who take care of the patients. We need the epidemiologists. We all need to work together. And it's really interesting when we have our meetings, they're all talking together in these forms. We bring, we bring them to Bethesda and put them in a room for two days and say, you can't escape. And then these conversations go on to come up with better and better ways. So I, to answer that, no, I didn't ever imagine we could do that. Hi, I have a question. So based on your last slide here, are there any projects that you know of that are integrating MRI, molecular genomics, and other blood tests? Yes. So like, is like Kaiser doing that, for instance, based on their EMR data? Right. So we actually have um, projects with Kaiser to do that. So our, um, right now, we have blood tests. So, so we are from the cohorts, we're developing new blood tests, but we also have blood tests that have promise. Um, right now, we're working with one from the UK, for example, from London. And um, we are um, um, putting those blood tests together with our new imaging with Kaiser patients here in Los Angeles. We are doing exactly that. So the whole idea is that things like the diabetes could be an early, very early herald of, of the cancer. Then we would have a blood test and then those patients who have a blood test, still, that's not 100% specific. Some of them will have early cancer, some won't. But then we'll have better MRI techniques to follow them to, to identify those who might have cancer. And by the way, um, the, what, what we're doing is, um, and this is a collaboration with Kaiser because they, they have all the information you said. Um, the, the imaging tests, um, we have to develop new kinds of MRIs, new kinds of ways to get information. So. Those surgeons at the table here know that when you go in to operate, the tumor feels differently than the normal tissue. It has stiffness, elastic characteristics that the normal tumor doesn't have. We don't pick those up in MRI so well. So, so we have new MRI, to, um, we'll call it um, evaluations or methods to pick up stiffness, diffusion of molecules at speed of diffusion, um, and vascularization. Um, and a couple others I can't remember. Oh, pH. We can measure pH differences between the normal and the n tissue and the cancer. So we're taking those who would be positive for the blood test and then going to, we'll call it the next generation of imaging. And so we still need help with bioengineers, et cetera, to help us with that. And we have groups of them working together right now. And we hope to have, we'll call it prototype models of the machines that we need uh, coming out in a, a year or two. Um, but that's how we're, we're we, I agree with you totally. That's what we need to do. Fantastic. Thank you. Last question from Dr. Lee. Hey, good morning. That, it is so exciting to hear we have a family consortiums and many di different disciplines move ahead. I hear one of um, your goal is collecting urine samples and blood samples from those people. 
Uh, have you, um, your group, think about collecting stool samples or other micro microbes uh, information? Because you know what we know today, we are truly not just human cells. We are a little community of human cells, and all the microbes live on us and inside us. And the related question is that everything, particularly in the pancreatic uh, organ, and related to our digestive food, have you think about collecting information, move forward about how we live, particularly what we eat? So, Yaping, great question. We are collecting stool. <laughs> I didn't want to leave. That. Sorry, I left it out. Um, so, we have a center. One of our centers that it's at Baylor um, is um, completely devoted to the stool measurements, the microbiome. And um, so, from our cohorts, stool samples are being collected. So, we actually have the stool collection kits and all that kind of stuff. Um, the patients take it home and then they send it back to us and then we freeze them and then we set, send them down to, to Baylor. So, we ve are very interested in it. Uh, we're not, we, we do have information about diet um, in our cohorts. Uh, so, we can do associations between diets and, 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 and microbiome. Um, you can help us on that. That would be great. That would be fantastic. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very, very much.